Hello and welcome to the show and an episode where we ask, what's wrong with the design industry and why has it got such a high staff turnover? Speaking of staff turnover, this episode is sponsored by Product People. Now, if you're a company founder or product leader who needs to get a product management team up and running quickly or cover parental leave, check out Product People. They've got a thriving community and 40 in-house product managers, product ops pros and product leaders. They onboard fast, align teams and deliver outcomes. You can check out one night in product.com slash product people to book a free intro chat and quote code OKIP to get a 5% discount. That's one night in product.com slash product people. Check the show notes for more details. Now back to the design industry and one founder's charge to make, God forbid, the Jira of design studios. If you want to find out whether swearing and cursing at people in your mission statement helps you or hinders you, stay with us on one night in product. So my guest tonight is Mackenzie Daisley. Mackenzie's a former tea entrepreneur who says she started out dancing with packs of sugar outside of an American diner. Now, I don't know whether she means she was waltzing with life-size packs of sugar or little packs tumbling out of her pockets while she did a jig, but it sounds pretty sweet nonetheless. Mackenzie says she hates being cold, so it's lucky she's A in Australia and B, she's been warming herself up with foul-mouthed hot and spicy takes on the state of design, which she claims to be able to fix with her new startup, Briefed, whose mission statement is, and I quote, to unfuck design. Hi, Mackenzie. How are you tonight? Uh, Jason, I'm absolutely wonderful. It is so good to be here. And what an introduction. There you go. I like to put all of the effort in to make everyone feel secure and safe so that I can then start to deconstruct them as I go. Yeah, I bet. (laughs) (laughs) Right. First things first, let's get down to it. You say that you and indeed your company have a mission to unfuck the design industry, which does beg the first obvious question, how and why is the design industry fucked? Ah, uh, Jason, that is such an excellent question. There are a couple of key, I guess, statistics or like a couple of key clues that really illustrate the problem very broadly. And one of the ones that I love to talk about is the attrition rates in the design industry. So by attrition, I mean staff turnover. In Australia, and from what I've seen, this is also a global problem, but in Australia, the staff turnover rates are 30%. And our national average, yeah, (laughs) nice. (laughs) The national average is 8.7%. So there is a huge cultural problem that is really, really strongly identified with working in design. Like when we talk about design and advertising and working within that industry, some of the things that we talk about is like long hours and terrible pay and being asked completely unreasonable demands from clients and having to tolerate sometimes completely unhinged management. The list goes on and on and on. And in fact, there's an Instagram account. In fact, there are multiple <laughs> Instagram accounts that detail all of these, all of these stories that people have. And they're, they're never without more and more stories to add. So. There is a deep cultural problem that is happening in the design industry, and it's almost synonymous with the kind of cultural problem and kind of work ethic expectation as the hospitality industry as well. So, yeah. So, in terms of like, why is the design industry fucked? Well, the design industry is so fucked that the national average of staff turnover is 3.5 times the national rate. But is that kind of agency design work or is it product design work where people are kind of embedded in long running teams or is it kind of just across Mm. the board? It's interesting. So that problem is the most extreme version of that problem is definitely unique to agencies. Yeah. And is yeah, it's definitely unique to agencies, definitely unique to working uh in an agency culture. And that is across like a creative agency or a design agency or a uh advertising agency. Once you start to separate design from advertising and design agencies explicitly and into kind of more corporate teams, then you're more a part of the infrastructure that is, that protects those workers within, within that kind of corporate culture. So quite different and quite unique, I would say, to working in agency. Oh, nice. Well, you should have come into product design. The water's lovely, but you're (laughs) here with the company to unfuck it with brief. So, Come on, pitch time. 
What problem <laughs> does grief solve for me and how does it unfuck it for me? Yeah. So when we talk about the culture being a problem, the biggest part of the culture being a problem is two, two things. The first is a communication issue. So a communication issue that happens between the design agency and the client, firstly, and then secondary to that, also the communication issues that happen internally. And so the way that a project is run from beginning right through into the very end is done with, at the moment, it's done with a lot of different tools. So an average design agency in Australia would use maybe seven or eight or 10, sometimes up to 12 different SaaS tools to kind of get the job done. And what's actually happening is none of these tools are integrated in any way. Yeah. Status updates are really manual. There's absolutely no automation that's happening. Communicating transparency to clients is behind smoke and mirrors. Files are lost or they're sent in a myriad of different ways as are updates. So you might have a file, you need to pass it on to a client or a client sent you something, you need to find that file. Could be in Slack, could be in Trello, could be sent on a WeTransfer, transfer, could be an email, could be sent to another client manager. The communication is siloed. There's a lack of transparency. There's a lack of integration. And because there's a lack of integration between those tools that we use every day from end to end, it means that there's also this lack of automation and a lack of data as well. And I think automation and data are really, really interesting. And I think they have the potential to completely transform design and the design process. And I would argue, and this is our, our kind of big <laughs> audacious goal is to, trans- <laughs> uh, to transform the design industry. Like, If we can create space by automating tasks, by creating integration, by giving transparency and empowering teams using technology, is that then space for people to go home on time? Is that then space for people to create more meaningful relationships with clients? And that's where we hope that technology and Breathe can come in and really start to look at and solve some of these issues. Oh, there you go. You're saving the world one presentation at a time. But (laughs) I looked at your website yeah, and I saw a proud testimonial that says, and I quote, you've created Jira for design studios. Now, Mm. what you just said sounds amazing. The solution sounds amazing. The use case and the kind of attempt to change culture sounds amazing. But are you really aiming to be the Jira for design studios? I mean, Jira. Jira is a really, it's a really interesting product. And I mean, you could talk about the whole Atlassian suite as being really interesting products. They, when you talk about Jira, depending on who it might be, might be a product manager, might be a developer, might be somebody in the design space. It creates a lot of different kinds of emotions in people, right? <laughs> and so that's, it that's putting it mildly. Yeah, yeah. It elicits a lot of different kinds of emotions. What I wanted to do with Brief, and when I went through and designed the UX for Brief, something I I wanted to be aware of the kinds of solutions that were out there that people were trying to solve this problem at the moment, but I actually didn't want to use any competitor products. So I had never used Jira up until that point, and now I use it every fucking day. So like (laughs) overly overly familiar with the tool. Well, yeah, as as familiar as one can be, but yeah. So basically. Do we want to become the Jira of the design space? I don't think we want to elicit such strong, (laughs) at times, negative emotions. Do we want it to be an all-in-one studio that empowers every single stakeholder along the workflow? Yeah, we absolutely want to do that. And we want to do that at scale. Yeah, I was going to say, you'll probably take the market share, right? And the valuation, if nothing else. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, both of those things. And and maybe we'll, we'll throw in profitability as well. That would be cool. <laughs> so. But this is obviously an R-rated podcast. We've proved that already. And there's always room for a good, punchy, not safe for work headline and a good old swear. Yes. But you're leading front and center with a potentially divisive 
Yes. Value statement, value proposition. And I imagine... Correct. Even in Australia, that that sometimes gets a bit of a, a raised eyebrow and maybe even some complaints. Is that true? Have you got any heat so far? Or are people kind of yeah in there with you and kind of up for it and, and kind of up for that spicy message? Spicy message. I love it. <laughs> it is so spicy. The short answer is, yeah, absolutely. We have pissed some people off with that line. We're an early stage tech startup. And what we are really hoping to achieve at this stage is to attract the innovators in the industry who want to work with us and innovate and help build a product that continues to be built with industry in mind. And what's been really interesting is like when we've kind of sent that messaging out into the, into the, I was going to say the metaverse, but not quite, but when we sent that message. I'm sure Mark Zuckerberg (laughs) wouldn't like that kind of headline. (laughs) I'm sure he, I'm sure he wouldn't. Oh, I was going to say something really rude, but I won't. But yeah, so the short answer is yes, we've absolutely offended people. What that messaging has done though, is that when we send it out like into the design space, the people who are innovators, who do have a vested interest in wanting to innovate and wanting to disrupt and change the industry and the way that it works, have responded in a really positive way to the messaging. It's really resonated with their experiences in the industry and not just their experiences, but also people who contribute a lot outside of their nine to five to try and improve the health and even I would go as far to say the mental health of the industry as well. Yeah. So those, those people have gotten it and they're like, bang on. But then you've got people at the other end of the scale who are like, I would never pay for your product. It's absolutely ridiculous. You don't need to bring in like all of these different features under one roof. I don't really understand it. Also, your messaging is vile. You need to one person <laughs> who apparently was the 2021 Australian Designer of the Year sent me oh, an well, email. That's, that's high praise, by the way. <laughs> high praise, high praise. He sent me an email and in the email he said, you need to change this immediately. It's completely offensive. And just like, <laughs> and, and just like clickbait, you click into it and there's, it's of no value to me. I was like, oh, my friend. But do you know what? Some of the messaging that like some of the other parts of his email, because he went to town on us, it's like five paragraphs or something. And like a lot of the information that he gave me was so valuable because it kind of really highlighted parts of our value proposition that we hadn't highlighted. And so we end up shutting down our website and completely rewriting all of the content and rewriting everything we'd ever written about the business. We kept the swearing though. We kept the swearing. (laughs) I admire someone with principles. Yeah. (laughs) But I guess also it's just, it's that kind of no publicity is bad publicity type angle as well, right? Like you're, you're getting attention that rightly or wrongly you wouldn't have got necessarily in other cases if like you were just another SaaS tool. So I'm here for that. Yeah. But the company's been going for about three years now, give or take, certainly according to your LinkedIn. I don't know how much of that was in stealth mode and building and how much of that's been out <laughs> so in public. Much. So much. So much yeah. of that. So, and you've kind of touched on it that you're still pretty early, but have you reached the, or do you feel that you've reached the promised land of product market fit or you're kind of oh. on the way to that? Great question. We uh, we are very early. So we have only just released the beta version of our product into market. Yeah. Once we finish that beta trial, that will give our, us a clear indication of where we need to go to next to reach product market fit. So we're definitely a number of steps away from that. It is the holy land. I do want to get to that <laughs> holy land as quickly as feasible. What I guess has been interesting is like you mentioned, we've been running the business for three years. It's been three years of ideation and COVID and we built one version of the product and shut it down and built another version of the product. Yep. And the one thing that we've done consistently is that almost every decision that we've made, especially in the second iteration of the, of the product has been in constant contact with industry and with our users as well. 
And so like there are very some there are some clear indicators that I feel probably nobody else on this planet would agree with me, but there are some clear <laughs> indicators of us reaching product market fit. And I mean there's a and one of those indicators is we recently had a company, which I probably won't mention because it's very, very early days. They have very much reached product market fit with our users and actually approached us to acquire us. And I explained that. Oh, there you go. Yeah, I explained that. that Cash out, get to the casino. (laughs) Well, that's probably, for the stage of where we're at, that's probably the only place that it would get me to. So, (laughs) So I was like, oh, we have a little bit more work to do. And what we've discussed is actually creating a partnership to kind of come together and capture and continue to capture that market together. So yeah, really exciting days, really very, very early, not a product market fit yet. I give it time. Yes. But obviously, before all of this, you were a designer yourself. You're working, I believe, in design agencies. You've also worked Mm. for brand consultancies. I'm assuming that you had some problems there that frustrated you, made you want to solve them, inspired you to want to solve them in the way that you're now trying to solve them. So yeah, what sort of stuff were you working on before you did strike out on your own? Like, What types of company and what types of work were you doing? Yeah, I've had a really, I guess non-linear. Oh, those are the best engaging. kinds, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree. I've had a very non-linear engagement with the design industry. I studied design and can design and am a designer by trade and have designed. I've worked on a very large freelance project where I had complete control over every single creative element and it was creating a brand for a tea company, which was really exciting. It blew up. I we came to an agreement, like a value-based agreement where I would take a percentage of their profits and I ended up having a passive income for three years. We created a brand that was so unique and didn't look or behave like anything in industry. And that was four and a half, five years ago. Yeah. And the really interesting thing about that brand as well is like I was in the supermarket the other day and I saw all of the same elements, the same language, like all of this stuff that that we created four years ago is now kind of translating into the supermarket. So that was kind of like really only uh, that and like other freelance projects. That's the only time that I've really designed. When I was employed in the design industry and working in an agency, I knew as soon as I finished my design degree that I never wanted to push pixels for eight hours a day. (laughs) Like I love designers, obviously, and I love design and I'm particularly good at it. But it is like the actual tools themselves don't engage or interest me. They only interest me to a certain point. So designing in a studio, I knew wasn't going to be the pathway for me. And I worked in client management. And because of working in client management within an agency, it was actually my responsibility to manage the client communication between the agency and the client and then between the client and the creative as well. And so very much was enmeshed in the problem right in the middle of it with all the stakeholders. And then that's where the idea started percolating. I actually left the industry after three or four years, four or five years. And I left for four or five years and I actually left to go and study Chinese medicine, as you do. (laughs) Of course, who hasn't? Yeah, 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 exactly. And then a series of events happened. One was the tea brand. I did a like product management course at an organization called General Assembly here. They asked me to come back and help teach it. And then I found myself back in a design studio for the first time in four years. And I was one of the first things I noticed is that the digital ecosystem had split wide open. So all of a sudden, you've got all these amazing new tools that we never had access to four or five years ago. Slack, Trello, Asana, Monday, on and on and on, this list goes. Tools that I use today, actually, to like manage my team, we're slowly migrating over onto Braved, LOL. Um, well, there you but go. Yeah, <laughs> they say you shouldn't dog eat your product, but you know. But yeah, so so walked into a studio, saw all of these tools, and I was like, two things. Why are design briefs being created still in Word documents and PowerPoint presentations? They're being sent over email. Updates are offline, in silos. Assets are being shared also on internal servers, offline, using a plethora of different tools. It was still all of the same problems, but now just dispersed across a really incredible tech stack that wasn't bespoke 
for the design industry. Yeah. But then you decided to go and solve that, as we've kind of discussed already. But was Mm. that then easy for you? Like, was it easy for you to then break out and be an entrepreneur, (laughs) a founder? Or was that something that you kind of had to Mm. kind of just jump in and work it out as you went along? Oh, my God. It's truly... I didn't even know I had a startup when I was at my first pitch event. Like I went to this pitch, (laughs) this three-day pitch, or I thought it was a workshop to learn about entrepreneurship. I knew I wanted to solve the problem. And when I went back into the design studios, basically what happened is like I had flights and accommodation booked to go and live in Bali indefinitely. And my intention was to stay there and replicate that same business model of taking like a value-based commission. Yeah. from the profits, have an endless stream, or a- an endless amount of like passive income streams and just like never work a day, a day again. So that was the original <laughs> plan. Then I tried to find a solution so I wouldn't come up against the same problems that I had working in the design studio. I realized it didn't exist. And then basically from there, found this weekend that I thought was to learn about entrepreneurship and it wasn't, it was a three-day pitching competition. So kind of walked in there. I know. There was like... Wait, that, surely that means you didn't even have a pitch ready. No. So they said you had to have this pitch ready, but I thought, oh, like we'll work on the pitch over the weekend and then I have a better pitch. But it was like, no, you work, you create a team, <laughs> you work on the pitch over the weekend, and then you're going to present it to three investors. And the the very first day, uh, first night, it was like a Friday night, I walked in, I pitched it. They'd flown. It was sponsored by Facebook. They'd flown this woman in from San Francisco just for the three days. And I pitched it. And with every other person, she'd ask questions, go to the audience. And my pitch was that fucking bad that she just (laughs) turned around. I remember she looked at me blankly. She turned around to the audience and she said, okay, who's next? And I was, I died. Oh, wow. There you go. Yeah, I died. I thought, oh, my God, I cannot do this. And then I went home. I cried the entire way home. I was like, what were you thinking? Blah, blah, blah. Long story short, came back, built a team, ended up winning the pitching competition. There was no like big check at the end, but what there was is that it allowed me to build some clout out to then go and build a development team. The last three and a half years have been about learning on the go, being ready to mitigate risk and to get comfortable with risk. Yeah. And also being willing to admit that. There's so much I don't know, but it's entirely possible to learn it. And so every single time that I've like needed the next thing, being willing to ask, allowing myself to be vulnerable, going out into industry, finding the right people, making connections has allowed the next right thing to come up. And then that's essentially been the last three years in a nutshell. Yeah, I think that kind of vulnerability is an interesting one because, of course, there's two connotations that I mean, one of which obviously is this it's very maybe anti some of the kind of hustle culture stuff out there where everyone's <laughs> walking around basically trying to say they're invincible. And I guess B, there's maybe almost an implication there that people might see you as less credible, especially obviously given all of the problems that we see published repeatedly about, for example, the difficulty or the more difficulty that female founders have, for example, being taken mm. credibly at all, even if they are walking around looking invincible. Like, Do you feel that that authenticity has been a net positive or do you also get kind of judged and talked down to by people when you are like that in front of them? I have been, especially in my early days when I very first, I just, I woke up one morning. So there was, we basically bootstrapped for a year. It was in the middle of COVID. I'd moved states and basically was living in a hostel, had sold everything I owned. And I woke up one day and I was like, you need to raise capital. And all I had at that point was a pitch deck. And we got really lucky with some really high profile investors very, very early on that allowed us access to them more and more investors. So very early on, we we were able to generate some noise. We were able to get some success. We got we negotiated some really great relationships, and then that kind of allowed and propelled things to keep going. In terms of authenticity, what's been really interesting is that I guess like there are different segments of everyone's personalities, 
And I think this is really interesting. And uh, I don't know if a lot of people will identify with this, but I think, I don't know if it's because I'm queer or because like, I'm just very comfortable with my masculinity and then also my femininity. But I have found that being comfortable with both of those aspects of myself, being very authentic, being absolutely a straight shooter and having very direct conversations with people has actually completely propelled what we're trying to do. I think what ends up happening when you're in corporate, there's an expectation, especially of women, what they should look like, how they should dress, how they should talk, how they should think. And often all of those expectations are in direct contrast to how men act or to act as supporting roles for men, right? And so I had worked and have worked in corporate. It was one of my first jobs. And I kind of, I I, I don't really align. Like that's not my vibe. So like, (laughs) (laughs) and I think I, I can be quite colloquial, obviously. Like our tagline is like, unfuck the design industry. Yep. And I think people... Yeah, people really resonate with that and it has definitely aided and helped us get through basically achieve success where I don't think we would have otherwise. Oh, here, here. It's always good to be able to be your true self, but mm. you've talked about having to go out there and get investment and I've heard lots of stories, again, from female founders about how, again, they found it was hard. Like they had to be more credible. They had to have an even better business case. They they had to kind of prove themselves more rather than just kind of just walk in and have people throw dollar bills at them. Did you find it a particularly hard process to go out there? Because I imagine also it wasn't something you'd ever done before, like go out and actually raise money. Absolutely not. Was that a hard process for you? Yeah, had never done it before. Didn't know what to expect. I can't give you an exact answer as to why, but I did not find it hard. And I did have money, people throw money at me. (laughs) <laughs> just it was just oh there you go yeah and I think it was the the network that I had built around me at that time I think that's one aspect of it I think the other aspect of it as well is that none of my investors very few a couple have but m- most of my investors have never worked in a design agency but something that investors and other stakeholders who have never worked in a design agency before really deeply resonate with is that they have been clients of design agencies before. And so them, some are in procurement, some are in management, some have worked in retail, some have worked in corporate. And so they have been clients of design agencies and they absolutely know how fucked (laughs) the process and the (laughs) industry is. They've experienced it firsthand. So I do think that there was this resonance with the problem space as well. Yeah, again, if you can get that narrative in a way that resonates, I guess that does make it easier. And if you swear at them a bit, maybe they give you a bit more money too, just to, <laughs> just to get you to leave the room. But the other thing I'll add to that as well is that that was the very beginning. And like as we've gone on, we have found it harder to raise capital. Obviously, like we're in a very different market at the moment. I made some mistakes. And one of those mistakes was holding out for an investor for nearly five months that kept saying, one more meeting, one more meeting, one more meeting. (laughs) We've done the due diligence. We want you to meet the partners. And I didn't know that we were were even ready to be considered for VC investment. And it just delayed everything. And then it delayed everything into the current market that we're in at the moment. So I think that that has been, yeah, that's been really challenging. And then I think as well, in terms of gender and then like having to raise in this market, there have been certain things that have happened with certain investors where I definitely feel like I haven't been heard. Like one investor, one of the largest VCs in Australia had a meeting with them and they said, they wrote me an email back and they said, oh, we think there's too many CRM products in the industry. And I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? (laughs) You actually, I didn't say this to him in the email, but he interrupted my product demo in the call. He's like, I want to see the product. And I showed him the product. He was like, why have you built rebuilt Trello? And I said, this is Kanban board. We have not rebuilt Trello at all. And then he's like, okay, I kind of get it now. And then kind of moved on to other questions and then labeled the product to CRM. It's definitely not a CRM. It's nothing like CRM. 
doesn't solve any problems or behave like a CRM in any way either. So yeah, there's definitely been moments where I feel like I've been dismissed um, because of my gender as well. Well, I'm sure that person will listen to this and think a lot about their behavior and hopefully be a bit better next time. Yeah. I mean, like every single time that those kinds of situations happen, I never wish any ill will. I just, I always feel sorry for people who behave like that or even knock us back because I think yeah, I understand the opportunity and I know that one day you're going to shake your head and you're going to be like, damn, if only, <laughs> I had, if only I'd invested at that point in time. So uh, that is my, that's always my thinking around it. I can buy you after you've IPO'd, right? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. But you said before this that technology can change culture and you talked a little bit about how you want to achieve that with your company, but mm. what's the biggest thing that you'd like to change with Brief? Like, is it just getting people to go home on time or is there some broader goal that you feel that like at the end of all this, once you maybe do IPO or whatever mm. happens to the company in the future, that you can look back and say, yeah, I succeeded? Yeah. Great question. And I didn't have an answer to that until recently. For me, I would love to see that 30% attrition rate halved. Like I would, I would love to see people who love design and people who love the industry and people who love having a, a, a creative outlet that also provides an income for them and their family to stay in the industry and keep doing the work that they love. Like uh, that's, the ultimate goal is to keep people in and to ultimately like a, a data parameter of what that potentially could look like is having that, having that turnover rate. Big goals. I'll keep an eye on the stats. <laughs> yeah. And what's next for you and the company? Any exciting plans you can share that we won't have to cut out? <laughs> uh, great question. Great question, Jason. The most exciting plan is that we're going to market with our beta product. We are currently engaging agencies to onboard them, which is really exciting. And something that I mentioned earlier as well is potentially creating a partnership with a product that has the same access to industry as we do, but we don't currently don't have any crossover in features. So yeah, the partnership's exciting. Talking to more agencies is really exciting as well. And we're looking to speak to, to more and more agencies. So I'm sure there are multiple ways to, to find Briefed and to find my details. So yeah. Well, I mean, just in case there are any agencies listening to this, where can people find you after this if they want to find out more about Unfucking Design, your journey into entrepreneurship, or maybe even try and find out what the heck kind of bags of sugar you were dancing with? <laughs> That's um, I am I'm going to break the mystery and they were tiny packets of one serve sugars and we had to hold them <laughs> hold them in our hands and shake them as we were dancing so i yeah. have this video proof on tiktok <laughs> this was over 22 years ago so there is absolutely no proof of that no that would have been entrepreneurial <laughs> absolutely absolutely missed out on that um, yeah, if you wanted to find out more about Brief, you can go straight to our website, which is uh, Brief. So the word Brief with a T at the end, dot A double P. Do not go to dot com. We have been trying to buy that website for a very long time unsuccessfully. <laughs> you can also reach out to me on my email, which is just Mackenzie at Brief dot app, or you can find me on Twitter. And my Twitter handle is my own underscore tech brand, T-E-C-H brand. Well, I'll make sure to link that all into the show notes and hopefully you'll get a few people sashaying into your direction. Great. Well, that's been a fantastic chat. So obviously really glad you could spend some of your time chatting about entrepreneurship, saving designers everywhere, and we'll cut out all the rest of the expletives. Uh, hopefully we can stay in touch, but yeah, as for now, thanks for taking the time. Uh, excellent, Jason. It was so great to chat to you. It's my first podcast and I think I've discovered that I just love talking about my business. So oh, there you go. I, I appreciate may it. May there be many more. Yes, may there be many more. As always, thanks for listening. I hope you found the episode inspiring and insightful. If you did, again, I can only encourage you to pop over to onenightinproduct.com 
check out some of my other fantastic guests, sign up to the mailing list or subscribe on your favourite podcast app and make sure you share with your friends so you and they can never miss another episode again. I'll be back soon with another inspiring guest, but as for now, thanks and good night. <laughs>